We are really thrilled to welcome you here, Pat, today as our keynote speaker on transcending the qualitative and quantitative divide implications for data, methods, and software. So, I hand over to Pat. Well, I'd like to express my thanks to Verbi and the Max QDA people for inviting me here, taking a risk in a sense of inviting me here, and I feel very honoured to be here at your 30th year and 24th conference. So, I'm going to be talking about mixed methods in a sense, but I'm talking about transcending the qualitative and quantitative divide. I hope in this, in this talk to disturb you a little bit in your thinking about methods, to give you some fresh ideas, and uh, for those of you who have been um, indoctrinated into the mixed methods community, maybe to challenge some of your ideas. So, the research world is largely a divided world. The Lastly, divided between uh, qualitative and quantitative camps. People tend to identify as being one or the other type of researcher. And the training courses are typically divided. You know, people do a qualitative methods course or they do a quantitative methods course. Books are divided too, and, um, and publications. Journal publications tend to have a preference for one type or the other, of uh, one approach or the other. Standard textbook descriptions of methods tend to be introduced with a classification of this is what qualitative methods look like, this is what quantitative methods look like. And standard textbooks that cover research methods generally will have typically have uh, separate chapters on qualitative and quantitative approaches. So, the ways in which they've been uh, described are many, and uh, at one stage, I, um, some years ago, I came up with a total of about 40, 40 different ways in which people had differentiated qualitative from quantitative research. What I want to say, though, is, is that Phenomena, the phenomena we study are actually not divided in that way. Even if our thinking about them often is. All phenomena have qualities and quantities. And we do well to pay attention to both. They also have temporal and spatial features. Sound, colour, age, permanence, legality, history. And we do well to attend to those features as well. So, we, we have worked primarily with the quality, with text and numbers to describe phenomena, but let's, let's see them more broadly. Let's see them as more holistic. So, what we have largely are divisions when what we need really is dimension. We need to pay attention to particularities in phenomena and not just broadly classify things as qualitative or in quantitative or, or qualitative ways. Phenomena are multidimensional and we need multidimensional methods. They are not divided uh, so much as each characteristic of, of uh, a phenomenon is, is dimensional. It, can be seen as uh, on a scale between one end and another. Let me illustrate that perhaps better here, where I've taken the same classifications, but this time drawn them as dimensions. And you can see that, in fact, those things that were classified or put into the qualitative and quantitative camps are actually holes on shared dimensions. <coughs> that there is, a, in most cases, a grading from one end to the other. And so any particular study is likely to be at different points on those dimensions. 
very rarely will you find a study that tends to be all at the you know sort of more qualitative end or all at the more quantitative end. Things tend to be somewhere along the dimensions. The boundaries then are um, are money. There are no defining differences. In fact, you know, we can say that um, a qualitative study might be, let's say, inductive, and a quantitative study tends to be deductive. But a qualitative study can also be deductive, and vice versa. And more often than not, there's somewhere in between where you're mentally shifting between coming up with new ideas, testing those ideas, and so on. So more in an abductive mode, perhaps. So the boundaries are money. Yet we can still sense a difference. We can still say that this study is more or less a, taking a qualitative approach and this study is more or less taking a quantitative approach. We can we have a sense of that difference. But what I'm arguing is the differences, there are differences in those approaches to looking at things but the boundary is, is not clear. Bergman, uh, Max Bergman from Switzerland, describes these as two interrelated families. And in fact, if you look back to that um, list, let's say you have all of these characteristics, you can develop a family resemblance model. Um, it's a method of um, uh, defining concepts, but where you have you know, if there are sufficient of these characteristics, then we would call this a qualitative study. Or if there are sufficient of these characteristics, we would call them a, a, a quantitative study. So what we call a family resemblance model could apply. So, as I said, Bergman says, okay, this is, they're like two interrelated families. You still know which family you belong to, but there's a group that, where they sort of belong to both. Or another way of looking at it is that uh, in the boundary between them is like the boundary between the pond and the field. So it's muddy. Uh, hence the title muddy boundaries. We can still distinguish the pond from the field. So you can swim in the pond, you can't swim in the field. You can grow grain in the field. But the other thing about that metaphor of pond and field is that the money boundary is also available. That's where you grow rice. And in, in research, that boundary is valuable as well. There are methods that cross that boundary. Um, I would consider, for example, a study ethnography, even ground theory can be um, on that boundary. I've done ground theory with numeric data. It's possible. So, the boundary can be unclear, but you can still identify on the field, and they're at each, both on the field and the boundary. The thing about uh, this um, way of looking at things is that whether we use numbers or text to describe something doesn't actually change the phenomenon itself doesn't change what we are, what we're studying but it does change how we look at it and how we think about it okay so what I'm wanting to do then oh, I know it's before I get to that let's look at one of the um, areas that sits on that boundary of course is the mixed methods area which um, I'm sure you're all aware has become um, kind of flavor of the season since about the late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, and I'm going to argue that standard definitions of mixed methods bridge the divide, but they don't actually transcend it. And so we have one of the most, two of the most quoted er people, uh, definitions of mixed methods. So Johnson, Onway, Bosey and Turner in 2007 talked to 19 um, or so, I think it was 19, mixed methods 
specialists or luminaries of the time and asked them what they, how they would define mixed methods and came up with a composite definition and this is what they came up with. And so they're saying that mixed methods research combines elements of qualitative and quantitative research approaches. The other um, well-known definition, or people that write defi the definition anyway, uh, Creswell and Plano Clark's book, also says that the researcher collects and analyzes both qualitative and quantitative data rigorously in response to research questions and then integrates the two. So they bridge the divide, but they do it in a way that verifies still the division between qualitative and quantitative as indeed does the Journal of Mixed Methods Research, which has as a requirement that the articles um, submitted to it talk about a combination of qualitative <coughs> and quantitative data. This presents challenges. The challenges come from disciplinary traditions and alignments. Some disciplines are more aligned to one approach than another. It come, the challenges come from the knowledge and the skills required that uh, people, you know, to, to carry out mixed methods, therefore have to have skills in both qualitative and quantitative analytic methods, or statistics and text analysis. Uh, that means there are challenges in methodological training, where they need to be trained in both approaches, not just in the um, in the actual analytic methods, but just the whole philosophical approach to those methods. And there are challenges in publishing, where journals will give preference to one type of um, research rather than another. The challenges occur especially in relation to effectively combining qualitative and quantitative methods or text and numbers in one project. And this is an area where I have spent probably the last 28 years or so working specifically on the, uh, the challenges of combining uh, text and numbers, starting uh, back in about 1993 two combining uh, nudist with SPSS. So, uh, yeah. There are also challenges, particularly, or were, in the presumed paradigmatic um, foundations for these approaches. This was um, primarily in the area of epistemology, and I have to say it began and has been resolved largely as a US phenomenon in education, but has infiltrated to other disciplines and wider um, environments. But it really, uh, a lot came out of US education and the concerns they had with the way that um, um, projects were being evaluated and so on. In fact, that history, to look a little bit at that history, there have been, throughout the decades, in fact, throughout the centuries, pendulum swings in methodology. So, in the early 20th century, and indeed prior, there have been typically uh, multiple and mixed methods were selected to fit the purpose without, without challenge. In fact, uh, when I did my um, PhD back in the in distant uh, 1970s, I relied to a considerable extent on the work of the Chicago sociologists and their community studies, because the first part of my PhD was a community study, and uh, drew heavily on, on that, their work, as well as the work of uh, British uh, community uh, researchers, community sociologists, Bill and Yuki, uh, they comes to mind, and various others, and they used whatever methods, and that in, in my PhD, I used, I think, probably about half a dozen different approaches to uh, community 
to the community I was studying in, in terms of gathering data. So there were mixed form surveys, um, key informant interviews, participant observation over an extended period, um, socially indicated data, census data, um, and well, that's a, I think that's about it. Yeah. And um, interestingly, when I look, I tend to look back recently at what I'd written back then in the 1970s. I found that I had beautifully integrated all of those sources into a common narrative. Um, so that was that was of interest. I'll come back to that point and the and the purpose of that point later. Anyway, back to the point here. In the early 20th century, typically, as I said, multiple or mixed methods were selected to fit the purpose, and that wasn't challenged. Mid 20th century. Psychology, education, health studies, and so on, attempted, were particularly concerned to emulate the natural or clinical sciences using what were called objective uh, quantitative methods. So when I did uh, psychology in the 1960s, we were, I never actually heard the word paradigm, we never talked about philosophies, but we were hammered on being objective and scientific. That was the uh, philosophy, you know, the uh, underlying uh, process. So then in the later 20th century, and this is around, let's say, the 1980s in particular, but starting in the 1970s and perhaps reaching its culmination in the 1980s, there were challenges to the hegemony of quantitative methods. The development of a naturalistic alternative, you probably are familiar with the names Lincoln and Huber, or Huber and Lincoln, and the publication in the 1985 of um, naturalistic uh, um, research methods. So this brought about, as they um, attempted to promote and distinct, carve a path for qualitative approaches to research, they placed an emphasis on the epistemological foundations for their methods, which were um, constructivist. And so they um, challenged the positivist or post-positivist uh, approach, the objective approach that disciplines had been taking in the social sciences, with the notion that we needed a new way of thinking, we needed to think in constructivist terms, well, I'm not sure how new it was, but they, there's a political agenda here as well in terms of making qualitative research acceptable and, and uh, making qualitative research distinctive at the time. So this was going on in the, uh, around the 1980s. What that did for those who were combining methods was create the challenge that the methods they were using appeared to be based on different epistemological foundations. And so what we ended up with, and I'll jump to the next slide here, was known as the paradigm wars in mixed methods. And so we went from uh, where people could talk to each other, or different methods, different approaches, different epistemologies, <coughs> could talk to each other quite happily, to uh, the paradigm crusaders of, you know, came along and said, you can't do that, we can't combine methods because they're based on different epistemological foundations, you know, this is, this is not, not on. And then you know, people said, but we've been doing this, we must be able to do it, there must be a way we can think about this, that we can do it. And um, remembering that this argument came up mainly in the United States, it was a United States solution of American pragmatism that uh, kind of helped to forge the solution to these wars. Okay, so, uh, just let me jump back a bit, and so in the later 20th century, uh, mixed methods began to be identified as a specific approach to methodology, named as the third methodological movement. So, again, there's a political thing going on here, in a sense of, of bringing attention to this approach to research, which people have actually been doing for centuries. Um, but, yeah, it's something about the politics of research, I guess. So, really, 
getting back to the idea of calls and quants and so on, and away from paradigms for a moment, let's think about data as a representation of phenomena. So research, when you, when you do research and gather data, you're making things visible. You're making things visible to yourself and to other people. And in doing so, there are multiple layers of interpretation. You select in both in selecting and constructing the data and in how you analyze them. Text and numbers as the primary forms of data um, of data that are used can each be treated as respondents' constructions interpreted by the researcher or as representing reality, uh, reported descriptively as what is. So, text can be used in both those ways, numbers can be used in both those ways. They are simply different ways of making phenomena visible. And incidentally, um, yeah, we tend to, as I said before, to divide things into qualitative ways of making things visible and quantitative ways. Margaret Sandalowski uh, argued that mixed methods, for instance, could equally well be a combination of qualitative methods, that different, different qualitative methods can be as different from each other as qual is from quant the variation within those methodological camps is sufficiently great, or is as great, as the variation between them. Okay, so data. When we rethink paradigms and epistemology and the connection with methods, if you think about data, let's think about, for instance, the, uh, the uh, concrete block, the brick, that you build with. The same brick can equally build a luxury monstrosity or a designer building. So data, the, are the building blocks of knowledge, are epistemologically neutral. It's the way they're employed that, that changes that. So we can use data of any kind in either um, fairly objective ways, as this is what, what this is, or we can use them in the more subjective ways if this is, seems to be or is understood to be. So numbers and words and what they mean are equally a human construction and I would argue that all research is interpretive. So paradigms uh, of epistemology influences but does not determine the actual methods you will use. So my alternative definition of mixed methods is that mixed method studies are those in which more than one source or type of data or and or more than one approach to analysis of those data are integrated throughout the study in such a way as to become interdependent in reaching a common theoretical or research goal. The key point in my definition, notice no reference to qual or quant, but there is more than one thing you're, you're combining, clearly, because it's mixed. The key point is the integration that occurs to create an interdependence between the things that you are, um, the methods that you are using, or the sources of data that you're using, or the methods of analysis. So transcending the divide between all and quant, or between um, any methods, implies having a common purpose or goal across diverse methods. And as I said a moment ago, there could be diverse qualitative methods or diverse quantitative methods. It's about selecting data on the basis of need, and I would add, and availability as a, as a criterion, uh, rather than type. So not thinking about, I have to have some num you know, some quant data and I have to have some qual data, but what data is available? What data can I do I need to answer this question? And what can I get hold of? 
the interdependence is the critical thing of those different elements in reaching the goal. And um, the reason for the DNA picture there, in case you wondered what that squiggle was, uh, um, is to pick up on the exchange. The DNA is, uh, of course, two, two strands. Uh, I believe they're called the sense and an antisense strand in some circles. And uh, there is exchange across the strands exchange of protein across the strand. What you generate is a sum greater than the parts, hopefully. We're heading now towards the slightly more practical end of, uh, of this talk, which hopefully will help to make sense of what I've been saying. I've summed up uh, integration or transcendence in um, seven C's. I quite like mnemonics because they help me remember things, and especially you know I can do it without actually looking at the slides. So seven C's of integration. I did start with three, and I've ended up with seven, which cover basically the whole process. So there is a conversation that occurs throughout the project between methods. And remember, it could be two qual, two quant, or a qual and a quant. Most commonly, it will be a qual and a quant, but not necessarily. Or it could be a um, text and um, geo geo data. It could be music and something other else. Yeah. yeah. So the conversation throughout the project occurs as ideas flow between, yeah, from one what you're doing with one form of data to another form of data. And that happens throughout, and if it's a team working, of course it's important for different members of the team to be in constant conversation with each other. You can construct one method based on another. This is the uh, very uh, commonly referred to as sequential methods, where the information gained from one method is used as a basis for another, particularly uh, where uh, qualitative interview or focus group data is used in the design of um, uh, surveys or databases. Similarly, uh, surveys or databases might provide the reason for uh, undertaking some interviews or or provide the sampling basis for, in, for interviews or whatever. I would argue that these are not really integrated until you bring the results of both those elements together. And so one of the common, er um, I won't call it an error, but one of the common weaknesses, shall I say, that I see is where people have carried out some interviews to design a survey and then completely neglect the interview data. And I would say, this is not mixed methods, this is not integrating. You know, to integrate, you need to actually then bring in that initial data as part of your writing up. So, constructing is a part of integration and transcendence. Combining is, in comparing and converting, you'll notice I have in bold type, because they are the core, really of integration, where you might combine data in complementary analyses, so you're bringing different kinds of data together, either merging it in some way, weaving it together, um, as I did in my PhD, weaving the different um, elements of data together. This is where, for instance, a, a program like Max is incredible, because, well, Max QDA, I should give it its full title, um, <laughs> it's easier to say Max, uh, is invaluable because, of course, you simply, if you retrieve what you have in a code, you retrieve what you've coded from all of your different forms of data. You've been able to import a whole range of different types of data and you can retrieve it together in, in, a, in the retrieve segments area. That is a great help in complementary analysis. The other thing that's great help in complementary analysis goes back to why my PhD was so integrated, or that part of my PhD was so integrated, was when I think back to, in the days then, of longhand working, the thesis was written longhand, the notes I was making 
were organised under topics and I would put survey results and other things as notes under topics and that's why it ended up as an integrated writer. So combining is important. Compare across data types and sources. Again, computers are incredibly helpful here. There are two ways that you can do this. One is that you can um, set data side by side. Look at your statistical data, look at your, new, your text um, and that data, and look at them side by side and compare to see if they're saying the same thing or they contradict or whatever. You can also, using the computer, use your variable data to sort your qualitative data. So this is where cross tabs become very useful. So your variable data may be just demographic data, or it could be um, where you have uh, um, scaled scores, test scores or whatever. And you can use that to make comparisons across your qualitative data. So for example, I guess one of my favourite examples is where people have filled in a visual analog scale for pain, 0 to 10. And they've also talked about their experience of pain, and the study that I'm thinking of was done after day surgery. So people talked about their pain, and they filled in a visual analog scale. And then the researcher, if they were using Max QDA, they weren't at the time, but if they were, could sort the descriptions of pain according to how people had scaled their pain. And I'm sure you can start to see all kinds of possibilities in this in terms of validating scales or understanding what scale points mean. Comparison also leads you to see um, dimensions in data, differences in the way people talk about something. So it may be the same number of people talk about something, different groups talk about a particular thing, but they might talk about it differently and you start to see finer dimensions in that, in that uh, topic or, or what was coded as a single code. The other uh, um, analytical thing that you can do um, the next C is to convert data. And again, software helps you to do this too, where you take your qualitative, it's usually done quant quant, where you take your qualitative data and convert the coding into variable data and then use that in statistical analysis. So this also is a form of integration. Again, it's important when you're doing that to look at both the statistical results and to review the qualitative or text data on which those statistical results were based in order to sensibly interpret the statistical data that you've got. So my sixth thing is to compile, to use all those sources together to compile some results and bring them together in the results. And when I'm reviewing a mixed methods article, I'm looking to see if the results from different approaches are brought together in the presentation of the results, not just in the conclusions, but actually in the presentation of the results. I'll probably get to say something about that shortly. Uh, and then we convey based on topic and not method. And again, I'll speak about that in a moment. Okay, so integration can occur iteratively throughout a project as information and ideas flow from one method to the other, often unconsciously. It can occur deliberately at points of interface where you deliberately design to bring different methods together. It occurs primarily through data management and analysis. It occurs reflectively also throughout the project as all thoughts prompted by the various data sources are drawn into a coherent set of inferences by the researcher. You know, reflectively thinking about that. A lot of integration is actually going on in your mind, of course. And then it occurs in the evidence that you present in the recorded results of the study. In practice, 
An integrated, multi-dimensional way of thinking about and doing research means focusing on your research purposes and questions, exploring the research problem from multiple perspectives, <coughs> design free from constraints on choice of methods, judging available data by its relevance rather than its form, analytic integration of the methods used, and integrated writing of the results as well as the conclusions, and as I've already noted, it benefits from the use of computer technology. So, we focus on research purposes and questions, and I'll let you read that, but I'll get another mouthful of water. There is some dispute as to whether um, Einstein actually said that. <laughs> and the, uh, and the, uh, um, the quote, or the idea, has been traced, in fact, to an, a Yale professor of industrial <coughs> engineering, unnamed, who actually said 40 minutes and 20 minutes, rather than 50, uh, 5 and 50, you know, um, rather than 55 and 5. But, I mean, it looks good to say Einstein said. And there's plenty of pictures on the internet that you know, suggest that. The point, of course, is the importance of thinking about your purpose and thinking about what your questions are. Can I comment at this point that there are people in the mixed methods community who will tell you you should have a quantitative question and a qualitative question and then a mixed methods question. I would argue, along with Stephen Gorard, that questions are not method specific. Questions relate to your purpose and any question can be answered by a range of methods. Even if it sounds like a qualitative question, I can, t I can show you some quantitative, some numeric ways of answering it. You, know, you might want to ask a question about people's emotional experience. We tend to think, okay, we should use you know, interviews or something. But psychologists have been using questionnaires and scales to measure that for decades. Yeah, so, yeah, the questions are not method specific. Methods come afterwards. From your questions, you should explore possibilities and develop a plan. Now, I don't expect you to read the details on this. And in fact, I, uh, this is something I, I thought of in the middle of the night. I thought, actually, there's a mistake in this slide. <laughs> the sort of things that happen the night, you know, during the night when you're before a, a talk. What I've done there is basically map out all the ideas, the possible ideas about that I had at the point when I was doing it about developing a research career or developing as a researcher. It's an area of work that I've um, been involved in for a number of years, or was particularly involved in in the 1990s and early 2000s, and. So, you know, how does one become a researcher? What's it mean to be a researcher? How does one develop a research as a researcher in a research career? So I've mapped out, I've used some conceptual mapping to map out the idea. And that's a good basis for setting up a study. What I've done in that diagram is also use the bigger circles, uh, identifying areas within that larger map which is sort of too big for a single study, perhaps, or too big for a single set of data collection, areas within it that could be addressed by particular sub-studies, but still needing for those to be integrated. The way that I, um, and then I suggested, you know, maybe there are some particular methods I could use for those sub-studies. When I work with researchers, I often say, you know, think about the larger project and map it out. But... You, you've got to do a master's or you've got to do a PhD. You, you can't do it all right away. So think about what's the bite-sized chunk that you can take off for now and work with. And that's what I've tried to do in that diagram. The mistake I think I've made is that I've suggested, generally speaking, a particular method for each of those chunks. And I would say, hold on here, there are multiple methods you could use for each of those chunks. <coughs> Um, and each of each of those chunks could also you know, be be addressed with more than one approach. So there could be more than one approach for particular chunks, and then, of course, the whole lot has to come together and be integrated together 
at the end, or during the process. Anyway, the point I want to make here is that you think about your purpose and your questions and map out all the ideas and things, you know, ideas and possibilities. I, I find conceptual mapping here really helpful in terms of planning a project and thinking about what do I need to look at, what, where, you know, where am I coming from, what literature is informing my ideas, because obviously the ideas have to come from somewhere, what past experience is informing it, and so on. Okay, so having done that, then you start to think about data and what data are available, and of course there's an enormous range of data possibilities, which I was going to list, but I won't, because I'm starting to run out of time. But the point here is simply to judge available data by its relevance rather than its form. So we have the uh, researcher, the androgynous researcher at the, uh, at the start, who um, is, you know, has collected all different kinds of bits and pieces of information, is uh, working very fast to uh, hard to uh, bring those together and ends up with you know a beautiful piece of work that integrates all of those different sources of data together into a final product so as i uh, mentioned earlier we integrate the analyses within and across methods and i think Actually, this is where I should have explained more of the combine, compare, compare, convert. And seeing as I've already done that, I'll, uh, I'll um, assume you've remembered. <laughs> so, within and across methods. So, within each of those chunks and across those chunks, or you know, however you've divided your project up, or you know, whatever methods you're using, combine methods, compare, and convert. Developing displays, models, and tables throughout the project will prompt and assist conversations between methods. I always used to hesitate at drawing things. I've become an absolute convert to the idea of, of doing conceptual maps, tables, little figures, drawings, using the maps part of um, the soft, of software to just Jot, even just to jot ideas, I think this might be related to that. Put it in a map, and uh, and so and gradually you build those maps up. So use models and tables to set out what you're finding because they clarify for both the researcher and the reader. Miles and Huberman famously said, "You know what you display." They used to uh, in the pre-computer days would um, push to have a single page display that summed up all that they'd learned about some particular aspect of the uh, the project they were working on, usually in some form of a matrix type table or what we would now call a summary grid yeah. or um, the NCRM would call a framework matrix. Yeah. So, I regard analytic writing as a key to integration. Write during analysis. You know, my comment about what I did during my PhD of making notes under topics. But writing during analysis to initiate ideas, to reflect on ideas, to deepen ideas. So that comes through memo writing. Integrate your results during their development. Sorry, that's where I should have mentioned the PhD. You know, the idea of, of the more you integrate them during their development, the more likely you are to produce an integrated result and to transcend divides. Design results around issues to be discussed rather than methods. And as you journey towards a conclusion, think of what you're doing as telling a story and or building an argument and in the process use an audit trail to support what you're doing. 
There is also an issue of um, writing so that the stakeholder or audience can understand. And in that regard, often it's useful. The integration of methods is useful because some of your audience will understand the numbers, other members of your audience will understand the vignettes and the, the illustrations or the whatever else you use from your um, text data. Or, and again, I'm, I'm tending to um, drop into the Qualcomm area, but yeah, different elements will resonate with different, different uh, members of your audience or with different audiences. I suggest when you're writing that the thumbs down, if you can read that, I'm not sure if you can read that from where you are, but the thumbs down is for the process which I see so many um, students lead into by their supervisors of you have a chapter for your quantitative results and you have a chapter for your qualitative results and then you, have, you might have a chapter which draws them together in conclusions. And in general, I would give the thumbs down to that and suggest that the alternatives are that you might start your results with the more descriptive elements of your results to set the scene or you know, um, describe some concepts and then get into the more analytic theory building aspects of the results. So that's one possible pathway. Or another pathway is simply that you um, have subtopic one and subtopic two. But what I'm suggesting is that you look at your overall topic. Your purpose was to explore a topic. Unless your purpose was a methodological thesis, and I'm not, not covering that, where I'm covering the standard thesis or article, it's based on a purpose that looks at a topic. So if the topic is the focus, then the topic should drive the presentation of the results. And I want you to think, in those of you that have reviewed mixed methods articles, so on, how often have you seen that? Not very, <laughs> is my answer. So, I would encourage you to look at that way of presenting results. All in all, I, want, I really wanted to push the idea that mixed methods or integrated data or, in fact, I'm not sure that I should have used mixed methods, they're just research is as natural as breathing. I've taken this idea from Howard Becker. Some of you might be familiar with this rather delightful little book called Tricks of the Trade. And there's a chapter at the end of it where he talks about as a sociologist. Sociology becomes as natural as breathing. You just, wherever you go, you're thinking sociologically about what you're observing. And I'm suggesting that as you are researching, you should be thinking naturally about there is only research, it's not qual or quant, but what data can I have, how can I analyse it, not does it fit a particular category or not. So just, there is only data, or there is only research. And so a mixed methods way, or a, or a, a data mixed way is likely to become a habit of thinking. Just as putting a seatbelt on for most of you will now be a habit without that you don't necessarily think about when you get in a car. You just do it. For me, when I look at any question that I am investigating, I just naturally go to thinking about what data can I use to answer this question and where can I find it. You know, what, what data are available, not what kind of data should I be using. So, for those of you that want some backup, there's uh, a couple of references here. Um, the first one is an article that came out in uh, the International Journal of Multiple Research Approaches in June last year. All you need to remember is International Journal of Multiple Research Approaches, Volume 10, Number 1. It's an open access volume. So if you look that up, you'll get to it. 
and uh, I have a, a, an article in there which talks about, takes um, Howard Baker's phrase of mixed methods in my bones, or he talks about sociology in his bones. And there's also an article, I think next to mine, by Gorard and Siliqui, which makes the, a similar point that there is only research, the liberating impact of just doing research. And uh, also you'll find that Marguerite Sandolowski, who is probably best known for her qualitative work, but actually makes the same argument of there's only data. And we should not be thinking in terms of I have to have qual plus quant. If you want other references to things I've written, my website has uh, a mixed methods page on it. Uh, where there are working copies of most of the articles, and if you want a genuine version, you can email me. And thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions.